Welcome to Uplifting Humans, where we honor, empower, educate, and inspire the listener. I'm Salindran Buller, your host. Our guest today is David Malloy. He is the co-founder of Changemaking Communications and Fresh Beginnings Personal Development Company, a systems analyst by profession, a coach, a presenter, and close-knit with First Nations for developing and teaching anger management. Welcome, David. Hi there. How are you today? Glad to be here. Good, very well. Great, great. David, yes, well, you know, it took us a little bit of time to get you, uh, but we're so happy that we did. So tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, David, before we get on with uh, some of the questions that I'm dying to ask you here. Okie dokie. Well, um, I've been doing this business with my life partner, uh, Raya Darcy Malloy, since about 1990. Prior to that, I worked for a corporate corporation for about 18 years doing all sorts of uh, systems analysis for them. And in that time, they smattered in some HR stuff. So I got tired of the corporate wars, met my love of my life. So I decided, well, let's go. She was already had a thriving self-development company, which was a predecessor to Fresh Beginning. So I just sort of tagged along for the ride as some people uh, tops public presentation work and say we been doing it basically now coming on thir close to 30 years now I guess it'll be 30 years this June. Wow that's a very long so, time a very yeah. long time. Now I know that uh, Rhea describes you as a guy's guy but a guy's guy who's very very sensitive and in tune and in alignment with her with himself. Um, how do you feel about that? Oh, I have no problem with that. Part of how I arrived to where I am is basically uh, I had to do a lot of investigating. Part of my work as a systems analyst is figuring out how things work. So I just applied the same tools to that as I did to myself. So I had to start figuring out how do I work. And I think today that's what a lot of people have ceased doing is a, you know, uh, the term, uh, I don't know, Ray acquainted, but we use it a lot is you're either a human being or a human doing. And I wanted to be a human doing. So basically, I did a lot of self-exploration. And when it gets to things like masculinity and femininity, part of what I always look at when we're dealing with clients or trying to self-improve myself is, what does that actually mean to me? Because what masculinity means to me may be totally different to what it means to you. So to right. define myself first, I have to go, with, okay, what's masculine to me? And I did it basically through observation. Uh, Ray and I were talking about this prior to the show coming on about the various things. And where I started for myself is I noticed at a young age and I noticed it right through today. So it's been 50 some odd years. I was in Walmart before the pandemic started. And I remember yes. this young lad was acting up and his mother turned around to him and said, will you quit being a girl? Mm. <laughs> and you start thinking this child's probably seven, eight years old. Think of the message that leaves. When you mm -hmm. say something as a parent, like don't be a girl or don't be a sissy or don't do this or don't do that. Like when you start at an impressionable age, and I think that's where, if you want to call it toxic masculinity, I think that's where that starts at, is the messages we get from home mm -hmm. and the messages our parents give us. Because of course, as we know in the work we do, you know, we're very much imprinted and we're very much carry over all the baggage our parents had because they have a tendency to unload it on us. Not mm -hmm. meaning to in many cases, but they still do. Mm -hmm. And part of the mm -hmm. part of life's work is basically unloading all that baggage you ended up with for the, usually the first 18 to 24 years of your life. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, I totally agree. Now, how was life growing up, David, for you? Oh, actually, was it? It was challenging. Uh, we had a lot of upheaval. Like I would say probably to about age 10, it was pretty good life overall. My grandmother in Winnipeg. And then my brother started having some issues and my mother packed up and moved us off to the West Coast for six, for six years. Mm -hmm. And then unfortunately in that time, she had a class 10 stroke at about 32 years of age. Oh, and wow. so I ended up coming, I became a care caregiver at that point and we ended up back, up, back up in Winnipeg. And mm -hmm. then I left home when I was about, probably 16 years old. Right, and there right. Was no father, there was no father in the picture. So my mom was a single mom. So uh, I sort of laughingly say in many ways, I 
I, I had it sort of lucky. I got into my family dynamic before my family had a chance to screw me up too badly. <laughs> so I, I like to think part of where I am today is I didn't have a lot of that stuff I had to deal with. Like there was always issues with my mother. There's always issues you know, with parents as there always is. But again, mm -hmm. the whole idea is go back, do your research of yourself basically and say, okay, how do I get to be who I am today? Like a uh, easiest example from a, a standpoint of masculinity, part of the thing of being the male is and being Irish, which didn't help, is I had a tendency to be loud. So for mm -hmm. example, I would yell a lot. And right. when I first got together with Rhea, I would yell a lot. And then of course her father was very loud and would yell at her. And then what would happen is she'd be superimposing her dad for me. So uh, I had yes. to learn from the male part of myself, raising my voice and also going against my Irish heritage, I found I had to stop raising my voice as much as I could. I still get loud, I still get uh, thing, but you know, I'm not screaming like we would literally have, and we don't mind telling people, we literally had screaming matches. Wow. We would sit there and think, think our biggest fight was three days. Okay, uh, so, so, so just, uh, it, it, if we back up just a little bit, two, two questions. One is that you had said to me that you had some challenges or your mother had some challenges. Can you, are you able to share with us some of those challenges just so that the listener can well, uh, maybe identify their own challenges with their parenting as well? Well, it was because she had a stroke. She was very immobile. She spoke, spoke extremely broken English. She was extremely hard to uh, understand they didn't give her much uh, they didn't give her much chance of actually living but she did she pulled through uh her english was terrible and what ended up happening is i did end up becoming the caregiver because basically the other two uh, my other two brothers didn't want anything to do with her so i was basically one who did took care of the house took care of her made sure she got to where she wanted so like as i said at a very young age i became the quote-unquote caregiver so and you're then, you were the youngest sorry david were you the youngest or Middle. Oh, you were the middle, of course. Yeah, it, it wasn't very much a thing like, uh, I think it was a year differential. It was like one, one. Uh, my younger brother was a stepbrother, and then there was me, and then my older brother was only like a year older than me. So uh, there, was, there was no age difference whatsoever. Right, right. Okay, and now we're going to speed back into, into things. Now, uh, you know, you say your Irish background allows you, now do you feel that culturally that there is, um, stereotypical, you know, things that carry forward culturally as well as with the parenting, with your own uh, ancestral stuff that you bring forward and... I don't think it's, I don't think it's, uh, I think it's cultural more than anything else is what we found in the work that we do is we bring all the stuff that many times our parents are dealing with forward with us. And in my family was a loud family. Like basically, you know, the, the running gag was he, who could allow, he or she who could allow, uh, yell the loudest at the dinner uh, table was the one who got hurt. And it was very much like that. And right. I also have one, also one thing, I'm deaf in one ear, which doesn't help matters either. So many times I'm not aware when I'm being loud. Like right. Ray is still doing that with me. She says, well, you realize you're being loud right now. I'm like, no. <laughs> so I, I've, I've got that little thing. But no, it definitely comes, this comes from a number of places. Usually the family of origin, if you trace it back, yes. and 400 years, that's where it mostly comes from. I don't think it's a stereotypical per se, because again, nobody really knows why some people are gregarious or introverted and why some people are extroverted. There's actually nobody can really tell you that. Right, right. Yeah, definitely there is some stuff that you carry forward for, for your um, ancestors, as well as your own inner child wounds that you're trying to heal. Now, um, we're going to move forward. We're going uh, we're gonna to go into now, what exactly is change making communications? Well, it's sort of, a, it's almost a banner for a whole bunch of work. My wife is currently, as you all know, writing her memoir, which I've been yes. there, Testimony of Hope. We've had, she's got tons of different blogs, uh, good multimedia presence. Then we had a whole series, we operated up until about, I would say 2015, Fresh Beginnings, First in Development. We still do the work, but we don't particularly, we're not, forcing that part of our business anymore. We just sort of go where it takes us. So we decided to create a banner called Change Making Communication to start using right. the multimedia side of things to do workshops and things. Because nowadays, especially the pandemic and stuff, it's very hard to get people to come out and commit to long-term, uh, like our workshops used to be eight weeks. And oh, it's very really hard to get people to come and make that kind of commitment now. So we found we've had to take a lot of the workshop, a lot of work we did from fresh beginnings. So we had fully 12 fully developed workshops. 
right you know, kid, but they're all anywhere from eight to 12 weeks and they also have different levels we had right. one body dynamics looking about weight uh men and women with weight issues and that would that was three different versions of it at eight weeks per thing so you're looking like a 24 week if you want to take all of it and in this day and age that's a hefty commitment so we sort of had to change with the times back in the day people wouldn't think twice of doing it now nobody has the time Yes, uh, time is a big, big thing that everyone's challenged with. So, so change making solution, uh, change making uh, communications is an umbrella company that you have with uh, different uh, parts of everything that you've done up to this point. I'm very, very interested, David. Uh, I, I do have a very soft spot for the First Nations and everything that they've been through, and I'm so, so glad that you know you were so instrumental in working with uh, the First Nations. Can you uh, ex uh, maybe take us on a bit of a, a journey here, uh, explain what exactly did you do and and what were you uh, and what did you feel about that? Well I started out by working, I traveled when I was younger when I hit about 23 years old I worked eight years for Hudson Bay Northern Stores and they were the people that did all of the Northwest Territories in Northern Manitoba and Saskatchewan and Alberta. So anyways, I ended up living up there, moving around for about eight years. So you had a lot of exposure to the indigenous community. And I'll, at that time, I was basically just doing retail and designing systems for them. So like, but I got to know the communities very well. If I fast forward and jump from there and go over when we started Fresh Beginnings is when Ray and I started getting involved with the First Nations. She's always had a First Nations influence in her life. She's done sweat lodges. She's done a thing, you know, a lot of different things with medicine men, et cetera. And then I, we ended up working in 2000 up at St. Teresa's Point for a computer job. But at the same time, I was able to start working with some of the kids and stuff in there to start developing life skills. Cause that's one of the problems, especially on the remote reserves, life skills are extremely difficult to come by. Mm -hmm. not, you know, they teach a lot about the culture, but how, yes. to, how to exist in our world really many times they just, you know, again, it's back to what we talked about full circle back. They see what happens at home, which many times is dysfunctional. And that's what they bring forward to school. Right. And so you created a program uh, that was uh, anger management or was that something uh, that we kind were, of was a stepping stone? Well, we were approached actually by uh, the province of Manitoba, Justice Manitoba to uh, come in because many times, especially in the indigenous community, white, it's, in the, it's in the regular community too, but more so in, in the indigenous community, um, there's a lot of problems with violence of uh, all makes and manner. And they were right. looking for, so a lot of times these uh, gentlemen and women from time to time are mandated by, mandated by the court to complete anger management courses. So we ended up working at a local First Nations doing that for about two years when we start, before we started working with that risk children there. So that's how that sort of came to be. We were approached, actually, I believe it was through Genesis House in, which is a local women's shelter in Winkler, Manitoba. So oh, okay. they referred us over, they liked what we did. So we started developing eight week workshops and that went on for about two years with them. And then we've done work with them ever since then. And oh, okay. that, that led us to working in the community. We ended up doing a two and a half year stint working with uh, children who cut themselves. Cause oh, that's wow. an area people don't, uh, it's not talked about and it's not an area people don't pay much attention to but it is a major problem on a lot of native reserves. So we did Why cutting? Is, were, were you able to really pinpoint where, where does this cutting come from? I well, know that they're, it's, it's basically they're trying to um, feel some sort of sensation because I guess, is it because they're numbed out by so much? Part, yes, that's part of it. But part of it was really surprised that we were not aware of it is it's also a cultural thing. If we oh. would go into houses and we would see grandmothers and grandfathers that had scars all over their arms, because that's what, again, back full circle, back we talked about, we learn from our, our uh, place of origin, which, be, which is our parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles. And these people would come in and they'd have all sorts of cut marks on their arms. And we never knew that it followed through as a generational thing. And it is exactly what you said. The problem is, the and, and in our case, we work with basic, usually with girls. Like right. Some some boys did it, but they were very hard to get to come in and do anything with. So as we worked with the girls, uh, we were in an unusual position where we had actually three of them that cut together, which made it, made it a bigger challenge. But it is exactly that is they want to feel something. They don't feel anything. They don't feel heard. They don't feel that they're useful within the society. They don't feel anything. 
So when they cut themselves, and it's not even the pain when we talked to them, said it was watching the blood. It's the blood that did it for them. It wasn't the actual cutting. It was watching themselves bleed that made them feel human. That wow. gave them some sort of purpose of that. And once you get to that degree, it's a lot of work to bring somebody back. When we first started on the reserve, we told them it's a minimum of two years per child to work with them before you wow. get them to the point where they may or may not. And then the seriousness of cutting is they graduate to other things. That's when they get into drugs. That's when they get to alcohol. That's when they get into all sorts of uh, addictions. And unfortunately, they run rampant in the First Nations. So you have to try to get them when they have the real serious problem. And of course, suicide being the largest of them. Like I mm. think three of the, gir three of the girls we dealt with had somebody in their family that committed suicide. In one wow. case, it was one of the girl's fathers. Wow. Now, um, again, you know, there's so much trauma within community, within um, certain uh, cultural groups. And of course, you know, uh, like I said before, First Nations is something that, uh, you know, a lot of people do look at and have a very, um, you know, soft, soft spot in their in, in their demeanor for them. Now, I'm, I'm wondering, did you end up taking some of this home with you? At the end of the day, I mean, were you able to come back and be in your normal life? Not, I mean, I, that, I would have a huge challenge and I'm wondering well, actually, how you would handle it. Well, actually we couldn't get away from it because part of working with children especially is you need to be available 24 hours a day. You don't have that option to go home and leave it at home, especially when working with the kids. So basically, that we we did two and a half years there, and in that time, it was basically seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Now we train the children only to call us when there's a big issue, like you don't want them just calling, "Hey, I'm feeling sad tonight." There's got to be, and that they did do that. That was one of many things. We had a couple of them who were talking about suicide or, or harming other people. They actually called us up, and many times they were actually taken off the reserve for treatment as a separate issue for mental health issues. So that showed us we did our job as a, ordinarily, if we hadn't been there, we believe they would have just proceeded and act upon what, what they were talking to us. But we had no doubt in one case, the RCMP were involved and removed the young lady right from the reserve. Mm -hmm. So basically it's not possible to really take, take a break from it. But the thing about us is we, we sort of have that wonderful ability to compartmentize our lives. It is, it's not, it's always in the back of our mind but we're always sitting there and, you know, it's like sort of turning the page and just move on to what the next thing is. Right. And I know that you and Rhea are big empaths. How, how did you handle that? I mean, how did you protect or shield yourself? Because uh, that, that would be a tough situation for empaths. Well, we do, we do a lot of different things. Part of it is recognizing how the culture is. But mm -hmm. part of it, it's great to be empathic. And I think the problem when you're empathic is you tend to swing way too far the other way and then that's all you are is we may be empathic but we're also realists we live in the real world and we bring all that in so yes we have an empathy for what goes on there but we also have an empathy for the fact that yeah we can make a change in a few lives there but we're not going to change the entire community we're not going to change the culture we're not going to change the issues so our job when we went in there is to like we we were at by the time we finished up we had about 20 adult clients and about probably 10 kids when we finished. And then of course the politics started and that's what ended up getting us out there. It's a change in regime. They decided to go in a different direction. It didn't go well for some of the kids. It went well for other ones. And that's unfortunately the way a lot of First Nations work is it just depends who's running it at the time and whether or not you fit into what their worldview is. But as far as empathy, we had a great deal of empathy for everybody over there. It's just, we realize the situation they're in. It's just, it's, you know, they base our term and we've used it with them is they're basically institutionalized mm -hmm. and they live mm -hmm. on the reserve. They have a lot of stuff provided for them. They have yes. very little opportunities. They don't like, there's not much employment opportunities. Uh, you know, there is some during the summer, but winter time there, there really isn't a lot. And also the whole area is spread out. So a lot of times that's another issue is from socializing, like with the, with the kids in the community, they, they would, it wouldn't be nothing for somebody to walk a mile to their friend's place. It's not like in the city or a small town where you can just go to the next door neighbor. You gotta walk a long way. So there's wow. also a sense of isolation when you even in a, even a non-remote, like you go up to a remote reserve, you really get how isolated they are up there. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. even in the Southern reserves where they're not, 
it's still isolating. You know, they do they do their best to have gets together, they have powwows, they have all sorts of things. But basically, it's, you know, you're living in basically an institutionalized uh, world there. You know, that's wow. what they come into. That's what they know. A lot of them can get out. Yes. You know. But they choose not to. Is that I, out of necessity well, they, or they just you know uh, what, feel? They, you know what? They choose not to culturally. I think it is more than anything else. It is part of their, the culture is a really big thing to them. Right. And, uh, they're, and a lot of them, they're struggling to keep their culture because a lot of people are out there and like they have they do have to deal with a lot of racism but conversely there's a lot of racism on the reserve as well towards white people it works both ways we were uh recipients of that as well while mm -hmm. working up there so mm -hmm. and what i sort of my line to them is like we're all people right. i don't really differentiate the native population from the white population a black population whoever it may be we're all people and that's sort of i think why we're successful in the work we do is that's how we do the trouble being empathic how we're empathic is we view everybody the same we all have different baggages we all have different things we all have different uh, things like i say to us uh one of the most telling thing was when we first got there is somebody had made the comment to us that one of the biggest put downs they had to be is like when a person would leave the reserve and try to make something of themselves this is how sort of insidious it was the person go off to university or something, or they come back to reserve and to uh, visit. And what a lot of people would say to them, oh, you're an apple. And we go, well, what does that mean? He says, yes. very simple. You're red on the out, you're white on, you're white on the outs or red on the outside, but white on the inside. Uh, okay. And that was very hurtful to a lot of people because they're getting out there trying to make something of their lives. Yes. And be it through that's a cultural issue or be it whatever it may be. Like we had to do, it was a steep learning curve. We're doing like one thing that we're very sensitive to is energies. And one thing that in res reserve culture, people don't realize is there's a lot of bad medicine goes around. There's a lot of people who are into the uh, dark. You talk about the empathic side. There's a lot yes. of people into the darker side, just as you have stuff in Wiccan paganism and other uh, belief systems in the quote unquote non-native culture, it's ingrained in their culture. And you have yeah. to respect it too, because we we had some really freaky things happen here, where oh, we had to do smudging, different things like that. Now, maybe it wasn't that, but maybe it was. You can't tell sometimes. But I guess the bottom line, my, my sweetest thing is, well, like we're all the human race. Yes. We're all one type of people, and that's sort of what the message for the company is: is that as much as we have differences and whatever they may be, like we're all basically the same. And now. Now, David, are you able to share a story of, of one of these uh, crazy things that happened and then you had to go into smudging and all of that? Are you able to share that with us? Well, we, we would have things where, like, we had, I'm going to actually switch it off on you and, and think about energies. I'm going to switch it a little bit and go to the white community for a second, but it, it's exactly the same way. We had our house painted and we right. had the painters who came in from a local town. They came in and they had really weird energy. Uh, one of the young lads was burned in a fire with a gasoline fire or something and everything else. And when these people showed up, all sorts of weird things would be happening. I had an angry computer client show up out of nowhere. I didn't know was angry. We had stuff break. We had the poor woman we paid. She lost $50 and we thought her husband was going to beat her if she didn't find it. We're almost to the point. She did find it. We're almost to the point of giving an extra $50. Like it was just strange. But And working on the reserve, Sometimes we would get sick for no particular reason. Sometimes hmm. stuff would disappear. Sometimes things would fall down. Sometimes uh, friends would act so weird. You don't know, well, why are they being that way all of a sudden? You know, we had, right. a, fire, we had a fire here out right. of nowhere. Now, my understanding is that you are actually a very, very sensitive, in tune, um, intuitive. Um, and can you share with us uh, some of the abilities or some of the um, cool things that you've actually been able to pick up? Well, I think part of, part of it for me, I think there is an innate sense of things. Like I tend to know when people are going to be sick. Right. And oddly enough, and that's, it's happened four or five times. A uh, perfect example is Rhea was out rock hunting. We lived in Winnipeg and luckily I went out with her and she went and twist, twisted her ankle and I was getting back to the truck and I'm telling her, your ankle's broken. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. So we finally got to the hospital. Her ankle was broken. And, you know, she thought it was a sprain and was going to go home. I met a friend of mine, a female friend in Winnipeg a number of years back and her breath was just atrocious. It wasn't like bad breath. It was just something wrong with her breath. And she ended up being uh, 
uh, diagnosed with non, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I've had a number of situations of dealing with people. And I just seem to have the ability to know when somebody's not looking, doing well. And I sort of put it back. I, that is an intuitive thing because uh, my uh, Ray, I used to see a guy named Dr. Craker who's a naturopath in Winnipeg. And we were talking to him one time and he said with his dad was so in tune at the time that would have been going back into the like, early 1900s. He said his dad was so in tune that he could tell what was some, wrong with somebody when they walked in the door, just by the way they carried themselves or how they looked. He was that in tuned and that sort of got lost when he went away. And I just sort of look upon it as that's just something I do. And, you know, even sensitivity when people aren't doing well, you know, people paste on their happy face. Well, both Ray and I could see through that right away. Like, right. We, know, you know, we know something's going on someplace. And a lot of times people are communicating things that aren't correct or whatever. We catch up on that all the time, too. So we just have this ability. It's we don't think about it. I think uh, Ray was talking about it. I think the bi- biggest compliment we ever got in the work we did, we were doing a uh, presentation, I think it was for a Jewish organization. And after, it was about relationships. And after the organization, this very nice lady came up to us after we were done. And she said, she's very quiet, very quick. She looked at us and said, are you guys actors? <laughs> so like, oh, uh, no, why did we sound phony? She says, no, 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 you are great, but you like play off each other so well when you do a workshop. It's like you have a script going on. And we sort of, we have a running gag. That, that's our spiritual script. It's like that's we right. play off well because we've been, A, we've been together so long. We're very sensitive to stuff that goes on. So that's sort of, in a way, like to me, it's a natural thing. People look at sensitivities for whatever it may be when you, you whether you're medical intuitive or you're, uh, you know, you have psychic abilities, whatever it may be, is we sort of look at that's part of being human. People tend to categorize that as not being normal. And to us, it's all normal. Yes, because you're embracing that part of you, which uh, which innately is in all of us, but some of us have a tendency not to use that. We use our five senses, so that's that's beautiful. Yeah, we and, get afraid of it. We yeah, get afraid of our talents. Yeah, exactly. And um, and neither one of you really uh, took any sort of a program to enhance any of that. That's just something that's always been. It's sort of like my computer business. I've done computers for 30 years and I've never taken a computer course. People have aptitudes for certain things. And we have, I have an aptitude for computers. My wife has an aptitude for uh, multimedia and for writing. She's a prolific and wonderful writer. So I think we all have these ingrained talents that we have to sort of embrace for ourselves. And I think what happens in the world a lot of times uh, I'll maybe use Rhea's father as an example is he had a lot of issues when he was younger in the family of origin. And the sad part for him is he was a tremendous artist. He could sing like crazy. And unfortunately, as after you read her book, it all got lost to the alcohol. Right. Like he suppressed that part of him. And Rhea was saying he was a great charcoal artist. Like he was wow. a freehand artist. He was so good at it. And he could yes. sing, he could dance, he could do all of these things. And unfortunately, because of all the damage he had, instead of, again, that's what most addictions are about. Instead of dealing with your issues, you numb them. That's and right. that's what he did. So all that great stuff he could have done or could have been or brought into the world was basically gone. And that's right. sad when that happens. That's sort of what we're about as a company in dealing with people is we, if there's a motto of our company, we want our people, we want people we meet to be the absolute best they want to be. And if you notice, that's I say right. they want to be, not what we want. That's right. That's, 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 that's very, very important. Put them back in the driver's seat and choose differently. Now we're going to just go a little off of topic here Mm -hmm. and just discuss now going back to the um, balancing the masculine and the feminine within as a male. Can you touch upon that for us? Well, this goes back to the original thing we opened, like where I have, I have actually a bit of a difficult with the concept. And the best way I can explain to you how I came to terms with who I am is when we did assertiveness in relationship programs, we had a exercise we did. And what it would be is at the end of the session, that's the day, right at the end of the course, we would, especially dealing in relationships because they deal with men and women and assertiveness usually deals with men and women. We would have this exercise that says, here's a man on one column, here's a woman on another. List me the attributes that are male in which case would be masculine. List me the attributes for female, you would call feminine or whatever they are. 
So what we mm -hmm. did, so they did all of this stuff. So for example, they had the typical, the women are going, well, men are angry. And we're going, well, don't women get angry? Oh yeah, they do. And they got, well, women are sensitive, men aren't. I said, well, aren't, uh, aren't, aren't, uh, men, aren't, aren't a lot of men really sensitive like in their own way? They may not be sensitive to what you want. So we went down the list. There's about 20 on each side. And I tell you, Salinda, you could hear a pin drop at the end of it. Because everybody was sort of sitting there with their mouths open. And the point of the exercise is we all have masculine and feminine. The thing is, though, we're all the same. Yeah. We're all, again, we're all people. And it, to me, it doesn't come so much to the masculine feminine side. It comes to how we're socialized. In my case, we touched on it. As a male, a lot of males are aggressive. They tend to be loud. Some are physical, which they shouldn't be. But many times they are. Because, again, this is what they're taught. They're taught to strike out. Women, if you watch how, for example, men will bully other men or other women by being loud or phys physically threatening. If you look how women do it, they ostracize. They use the social constructs to uh, bully people. So it's more, they all do the same thing, but a different way. So when I look at masculine feminine, it's just a different example. I don't think about it. For example, I do all the cooking in the house. Not yes. because Rio's not a great cook. I just like cooking and it's sort of, as we've been together 30 years, we have, we have a large household to take care of, lots of commitment. So I just, it's dropped to me to do the food. You know what? I don't give it a second thought. This is yes. what I do. And I think that's the problem when you get into the masculine and feminine. If you're comfortable with yourself, what it like, Ray will tell you, I've worn wigs around the house, but it's like, uh, you know, what it's, I, what it's uh, St. Patrick's Day, I had my funny, uh, and she had a funny green wig I was wearing for a while. Like, I don't have a problem. I would carry her per a perfect example. We go into Winkler, which is a very fundamentalist Christian town. And I would carry her purse around because when I first met her, her body was this bad shape. Her shoulder was out of, out of joint all the time. I remember walking out of one of the thrift stores one day and I was carrying her purse. It's going to see this big, hefty, nice woman. She says, oh, how dare you be wearing a purse, blah, blah, blah. And I just turned and said, what's wrong, darling? Doesn't it match my outfit? <laughs> Also, like, I don't think about such thing. I'm carrying my wife's purse. I'm not carrying one. And I think if you can balance the two off about, we all have each aspect of that within ourselves. If you can balance that concept off, you know what? You don't pay attention to it. I don't pay attention anymore what's considered male or female anymore. And I think where the trouble starts is when everybody starts trying to define that all the time. So for mm -hmm. me, if I'm a sensitive male, it's because I'm trying to integrate as a whole person, all parts of me, not just my masculine, my feminine. I'm trying to integrate the Irish side, my wounded child. I just it's like trying to do the constant juggle that you never finish in life to your to you end your life and move on. So with me, I try to make it an even keel. I then the other part that I do a lot of is I research. I'm inquisitive. And that's helped me a lot in balance the two things off. Like I said, I had it took a lot of time for us to figure out why I was so loud and why Rhea was turned off about it. And that's a perfect example where you have the masculine and the feminine come in. Because if you look back in the 50s, the men ruled the roost. That would have been her father, 40s and 50s. Men mm -hmm. ruled the roost, women were subver subservient. And that's the way it went for 20 to the 1960s. Well, by that time, Rhea had turned into a nice young lady and she wasn't having it with her father anymore. So they would have the wards, they would have the yell. There'd be all the hurt feelings. So the minute we got together and started working through stuff and I would yell at her, she wouldn't see me, she'd see her father. Of course. And, and not even happen. not even notice, not yeah. even notice that it was her father. She would just look at you and yeah. and emotionally be triggered without even going down that. And then coming to realization that it was something to do with her father. So like I said, we, we have the advantage of sort of part of the English working on each other. Yes, <laughs> like we have yes. lots, like we sit here working together 24 seven. Like yes, I've never yes. worked out, you know, I've had a job outside of them, but we're basically together all the time. And mm -hmm. to make that work, the most important part is we like each other's company and yes. we find each other interesting to this day. We had a nice conversation before you came, before we started with you today about a whole bunch of different things going on in the world, going on with us, things that we're trying to like, this morning's a perfect example. We woke up this morning, we were both cranky this morning. We don't mm -hmm. know why we were cranky this morning, but we were. Well, then when that happens, time was we would make the mistake of staying together and the war would be odd. Now we sort of go to our separate corners and try to get, find, okay, what's this about? I guess I just didn't sleep good because I can't pin it down to anything. I know Ray had a bit more of a rougher night with a couple of things. So that's what we put it down to and we move on. But, mm -hmm. you know, what we've developed our relationship to do with men and women is I don't like repetition. Mm -hmm. A lot of women's conversational style is repetitive. So I've had to learn 
being a male, my masculine side to work with that. A lot of women, uh, the, best, the best example I can give you is we call it selective memory. If you go to a wedding, uh, let's say you were having a fight about something and in the middle of it, and, I'm t and Ray and I are getting very loud about things and I say something she doesn't like, she'll say, well, you know, when we were at that wedding two years ago and you said this, uh -huh. I'm going, well, I'm a guy. What's that got to do with? I thought that was all done with. You know, so to me, these issues are resolved. To her, it obviously wasn't. And that many times that goes back to the masculine, masculine and feminine. Masculinity, by and large, we tend to move on with things. But if something happens, our best example is Ray's thing when she worked in a uh, real estate agency, is a guy yes. sometimes would have pitched battles in the agency and go out for a beer later. And she said, well, women ever did that, they wouldn't talk to each other. And that's where the masculine and feminine come, come into play. Those are true differences between the sexes. Yes, yes. Now, um, I know that, uh, you know, you've got so many things that are actually coming forward and you're working on something always because that's just the way that you and Rhea work. Uh, what can we expect in the next little while? Is there something that you want to share with the audience? Well, the main thing right now is the book. That's been consuming all our time because it's such a large manuscript. Uh, we're sort of looking at the countryside is we're going to part of under Change Maker and maybe under your banner as well is start to put out, I think what we're going to do is go to the seminar format initially or speaking format and just start posting some videos and stuff to get people like this forum sort of what we're like and what we're about. And that way people get a thing in. Because again, what we do is not going to fit for everybody. And we don't mm -hmm. expect it to. And so we just want to sort of, we've been sort of cloistered for the last, it's probably about, I'd say 2012 to 15. We sort of slowed down. So the last five years, we're going to regroup back to what you talked about dealing with the reserve is there's not that there is no side effects. It just was with your question, there was no, you know, we were with it all the time. So we basically got away from it. So now it's sort of looking at the world going, yeah, I think we want to try doing this again. Great. So That's we're great. Start, we're going to start back up on probably the presentation work the workshops and the various things. And Rhea does a whole whack as I do uh, online counseling for people. We do a Wonderful. lot of that. Like she's got clients in Africa. Uh, she's got clients, well, I had a client in England, she says passed away, got down in the States, there are quite a few people. And I have a number of mine that I work with. So we basically use Skype or whatever it is, or sometimes we just talk on the phone. Yes, yes, well, that's wonderful. Uh, are you able to share what is in the book? Oh, the book, I should actually have my missus over here, but I'll tell you, well, I can tell you because I've listened to it about 12 times. Of course, of course. <laughs> what, it, what it basically is, it is a memoir. So basically it's how Ray remembers her life from the time she was born growing up and right through to the end of her father's death. We sort of ended it there. So there could be a book too with everything that happened. Out of it. So basically it goes from 1942 to 1998. Okay. And so basically what it does is it follows her informative years and the highlights of the book and how she basically come to terms with and overcame a whole bunch of stuff in her life. And the first thing that happened, like she had fairly decent childhood overall until she got in the 50s and got polio. And then once she got polio, she deals with the after effects of there. And basically after that point, the family fell apart. And, right. and as they, there's all, you know, there is sexual abuse involved in it. And back in the 50s, they never dealt with that. So what the, she ended up doing is they put her into a, a mental hospital off and on for five years, gave her 129 ECT treatments and whacked her up with a whole bunch of antipsychotic drugs. So the fact she's where she is today is absolutely astounding. It just shows the metal of who she is as a person and as a spirit. So base, and then it went on from there, like she was one of the little highlights. She's one of the first people, probably in North, women in North America, ever to have a live talk show. Lovely. So she was, she was on public access TV and she used to do live shoots out of a hotel Fort Gary in Winnipeg. And Wonderful. Then, and I went, so she did always a TV work. She was an exotic dancer. That's an interesting chapter. Yes. In exotic dancing business. And then as things sort of got married, and then as they sort of went, and basically after that follows the trials and tribulations more with her and her family and how she came to terms of forgiveness and how she came to terms to understand about how wounded her, family, her parents were. Because I'm, I'll be blunt, they did a number on her. Like they really did. They did a lot. Yes. Like, like being, yes. Especially, especially being the time they were is image was everything in their right. world. And right. they didn't want a sick daughter who was making their image not look good. Yes. So, that, so that was a constant theme the entire time 
that uh, she was living with them is, uh, we, we have a funny running joke. We say like, everybody always says, uh, uh, she can't uh, she can't be right all the time. That's what her parents think. And the funny part was you read the book, she probably wasn't but right most of the time. But that was one of the big things. And also the big thing she had to deal with, and we're still dealing with it today, is she was an only child. And well, that yeah, that, that, that brings a whole a whole bunch oh, of different things. That's a whole, that's a whole yes. other program. That's right. That's a that's an in, uh, amazing amazing but run. But but basically, it's a roadmap. To, I mean, basically, if I'm going to call it, it's a roadmap to how you forgive. Because in the end, her father dying, she was there for him, supported him, even though all the stuff that happened with her, because she found a road to forgive him. And that's yes. basically a nutshell what the book really is. It's a very interesting that I've, 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 I've heard it probably coming on 12 to 15 times now with the revisions we've done. Wow. And each time, I'm, I'll just sit up there and I'm happy to hear it, even though a lot of times I know what's happening. Because it is, and we did test Marty. It's just a very nice read. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. And I look forward to it. And I'm sure that there's lots of people that would love to get their hands on, on this beautiful, water. miraculous life of Rhea. Yep. And, uh, and as we uh, come to the end of the show here, uh, David, I would like to um, ask you if there's uh, anyone in the audience who wants to get a hold of you, how can they get a hold of you or anything else that you would like to share that we haven't covered today? Well, I think we covered a lot of stuff. It's such an in-depth topic that you know, even spend what it's forty-five minutes. We're just scratching the surface of it right now. It's just the only. I think the biggest thing I try to live my life by is two things: I don't have great expectations of people and love people, accept them for who they are, for poor bullshit, whatever. Just love the people that are in your life, and more importantly, just ex don't expect things from them. And this is a whole thing that we worked with. The thing is, the more you expect in your life from people, the more they're going to disappoint you and the more unhappy you're going to be. And that's, Thank like, you. that's a big, big, big problem. Yes. You know, yes. So basically, so and as far as getting a hold of us, I'll give you actually our uh, private emails is the easiest way to get a hold of us. And in my case, it'd be DB Malloy, David Bruce, DB Malloy at gmx.com. And in okay. Rhea's case, it would be rayastar at gmx.com. Wonderful. Well, thank you so and we're much. Always we're always happy to hear from people. Yes, yes. And uh, they're on social media. So do uh, look for that as well. well and <laughs> what's that? Her more than me. That's right. That's I, I, right. Well, I'm a computer guy, but social media just baffles me. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, well, it's been great chatting with you, and we will definitely have you back on again, David. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And uh, I'm Solyndra Miller from Uplifting Humans, uh, where we honor, empower, educate, and inspire the listener with real stories and expert advice. Uh, I look forward for you to log on to upliftinghumans.com where we will have this podcast. Please spread the word and bring more listeners forward. Until next time, thank you so much and have a wonderful day.